Hello, my name is Megan DeDios, and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Director of Continuing Education. Thanks to each of you for joining us this evening for our annual Pine Memorial Lecture on Ministry with Persons with Disabilities, our sixth lecture in our Fall 2023 Continuing Education Lecture Series. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this by offering presentations such as this one, as well as online courses, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our final event of the semester is our annual Ministry Renewal Day, and it will be held on Friday, November 17th at 10 a.m. in the Heights Room on the Chestnut Hill campus. The morning will start with a prayer service and light refreshments. SDM professor Heather Dubois will offer remarks on Catholic resources for trauma mitigation. We hope you will join us. Information regarding this event is available in this flyer, which is right here in this room on our um, table of promotional items. It'll, we'll also include details in the follow-up email for you to join us. We hope to see you there. Thanks to our speaker, Dr. Barton, for granting us permission to record today's event. As soon as the recording is available for viewing, likely within a month, we will notify registered participants of the availability of the recording. It's going to be posted on Encore Archive, which we have uh, bookmarks with the address. If you'd like to grab one, they're on the table. Speaking of bookmarks, please be sure to visit the BC Bookstore table at the entrance to the room right when you came in. The bookstore has Dr. Barton's book, Becoming the Baptized Body, Disability and the Practice of Christian Community, available for purchase. During this program, there's going to be an opportunity for a conversation and Q&A, and there are two points to keep in mind. First, before you ask a question, please wait for the microphone. Um, it helps everyone to be able to hear it, and our online audience will need it for them to hear your question as well. And second, please know that if you do ask a question or make a comment, it's likely going to be part of the final video and could have a very long life. Um, just make sure you're okay with that um, before you ask your question. For those of us joining online, please post your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen at any time during the presentation. My colleague James will be able to share your question during the conversation portion of, the evening, of this evening's event. We will aim to answer as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. You will notice a closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. Many thanks to Thais and Isabella, graduate students here at the SDM, for assisting with the closed captioning for us today. Now for today's presentation. In 1991, the first Pine Lecture was held at Weston Jesuit School of Theology, the generous gift of Professor Margaret Pine, and it continued here at the School of Theology and Ministry beginning in... Oh no, beginning in 2009. <laughs> a lifelong advocate for persons with disabilities, Margaret Pine served as Associate Dean of Special Education at Lesley College. She saw the need to educate theological students about ministry for and with persons with disabilities. And she felt so strongly about this that she donated this lecture series. We owe Professor Pine a debt of gratitude for her vision and foresight. Her gift ensures that this topic is front and center on a regular basis in our programming for graduate students and for the public. We have two special guests with us tonight, Anne Barry Goodfell and Ruth Ann Rasbold, who are right up here in the front. Anne is the trustee of the Pine Endowment Trust, and both she and Ruth Ann were personal friends of Margaret Pine. Thank you both for your continued support and participation. I now invite Father Michael McCarthy, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Good e evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation, Disabling Discernment, Baptism and Christian Ministry. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Dr. Sarah Jean Barton is a theologian and occupational therapist with a Doctor of Theology degree from Duke Divinity School. She completed her occupational therapy training down the block at Boston University. Her research interests include theology and disability, research in collaboration with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, bioethics, liturgy, and occupational engagement in religious activities. She has published and presented in a variety of interdisciplinary contexts on issues related to Christian theology and ethics, 
intellectual disability, spirituality, disability studies, and occupational therapy. Dr. Barton is the author of Becoming the Baptized Body, Disability and the Practice of Christian Community. Currently, Dr. Barton is Assistant Professor of Occupational Therapy and Theological Ethics at Duke University. She holds a dual appointment in the Occupational Therapy Doctorate Division in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the School of Medicine, as well as at Duke Divinity School. She also works as a pediatric occupational therapist at Duke Health, with special expertise in collaborating with families and children experiencing medical complexity, trauma, or neuromuscular disorder. Dr. Barton holds an American Occupational Therapy Association board certification in pediatrics. Dr. Barton, Barton was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, just a little out of Seattle. She is an active lay leader in the Episcopal Church who currently worships at St. Joseph's Episcopal Church in Durham, North Carolina. She also serves in a broader ecumenical and interfaith settings as a teacher and consultant on issues related to cultivating faith communities that support the leadership, gifts, and participation of disabled people. We are honored to have such a gifted scholar joining us here today at the Boston College School of, of Theology and Ministry. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Barton. Thank you, Dean McCarthy. I'm so grateful for the invitation to be present here with you all and to present this year's Pine Memorial Lecture. I want to give my special thanks especially to the trustees of Pine Endowment, as well as the friends and family of Professor Margaret E. Pine, whose insistence upon robust conversations about disability in spaces of theological education and formation make tonight's presentation possible. I'm also grateful to the faculty, administration, and staff at the School of Theology and Ministry here at Boston College, and in particular, Megan Dadios and Carl Sullivan, with whom I've been coordinating and been in touch with over the past months. And finally, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you, those of you who are here in person and who are attending virtually at this event, as well as those of you who will be listening to a recording of this lecture at a later date. So with this gratitude, I'd like to begin. I've titled tonight's lecture, Disabling Discernment, Baptism and Christian Ministry. And as the title of the Pine Lecture Series suggests, in highlighting ministry with people with disabilities, and not ministry to, ministry for, ministry at, or ministry on behalf of, we will consider tonight how disabled Christians might lead us in informing, shaping, and even reimagining our practices of discernment. I'll say more about what I mean by discernment in the next section of my lecture. But for now, I want us to all begin thinking about how we identify and amplify gifts for ministry that the Holy Spirit pours out on all Christians in our baptisms. In other words, how do we go about honoring the baptismal identities of those in the body of Christ? In the words of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the common priesthood of the faithful. And what does the human experience of disability, and in particular, Christians with intellectual disabilities, reveal to us about the expansive possibilities for baptismal vocation and Christian ministry in the church? It is likely no surprise to those of us who are gathered here that views about the ministries of disabled Christians, or even ministries to Christians with disabilities, often have quite a narrow scope. Across the centuries of church history, the human experience of disability has often been considered a disqualification for serving as a Christian minister, especially in an ordained capacity. People with disabilities have often been the recipients, and some might even say objects, of Christian charity throughout the history of the church, with more contemporary forms of so-called disability ministry often still entrenching disabled Christians into restricted identities and restricted forms of ministry. 
For example, disabled Christians may be offered a special service on a monthly or yearly basis where they don't gather with the regular congregation. They meet at a separate time and maybe even in a separate worship space. Christians with disabilities might not be or might be considered as inspirational or prophetic or beacons of innocence and purity. And perhaps there are people with disabilities, as well as non-disabled people in our parishes, who witness to us in these kinds of inspiration or prophecy, innocence, or purity. But instead of first considering someone's body, or their mind, or their limitation, their diagnoses, or their disability, for us to determine what kinds of ministry or what kinds of witness they might embody within the church, I will argue tonight that instead, we need to cultivate communities of patient attention to the Spirit's expansive and surprising gifting for ministry in one another's lives, including disabled Christians. And in particular, I want us to think about practices related to baptism that might support the work of this discernment. My most recent theological research, culminating in a book entitled Becoming the Baptized Body, investigated the experiences of Christians with intellectual disabilities related to baptism. Through work as a participant observer at Christian churches across various traditions, I worshiped with and spoke with and spent time with disabled Christians, witnessing how their identities as those baptized into Jesus's body shaped their everyday lives of faith. The research initially emerged from the story of a family I knew as an occupational therapist at Duke who were seeking baptism for their adolescent daughter in a credo Baptist tradition, so a church where some kind of evidence or testimony or verbal declaration of faith precedes the baptismal act. Unfortunately, this family experienced baptismal denial for their daughter at over a dozen churches, with communities of faith expressing that since their daughter had an intellectual disability, she wouldn't understand what happened in baptism and therefore it wouldn't matter to her. Other churches expressed that she was too disruptive and had support needs beyond their capacity, so they could not welcome her as a member. Of course, in the Catholic tradition and most mainline Protestant denominations, baptism occurs across the lifespan. It is not contingent on disability identity or other, any other kind of form of human limitation. And while I thought this alternative theological approach to Christian initiation might be the simple solution for the family who experienced these repeated baptismal denials, my research revealed that even in contexts where baptisms are celebrated regardless of age and of disability identity, disabled Christians who had been baptized at a younger age often found that as they grew older, their gifts for ministry were no longer honored or discerned in the church, especially for disabled Christians who others perceived as being, quote, disruptive or made other people, quote, uncomfortable. Both of these situations, one of baptismal denials and the other of a failure to uphold the promises we make at baptism, signal to me, if not a complete absence, of discerning these Christians' gifts for ministry, at the very least, a significantly impoverished practice of discernment about how the Holy Spirit is working in and through these members of the body of Christ to minister and to lead and to renew the church. So tonight, drawing from my research in collaboration with Christians with intellectual disabilities, I will claim that disabled practices of discernment welcome us into an expansiveness about how we perceive the ongoing work of the spirit in the church today. Disabled Christians bring a critical perspective to not only how we discern, but how we also amplify the work of the spirit among all the baptized. In particular, I will argue that our baptismal practices offer one powerful avenue that in our various communities, within our parishes, but also our vocational contexts, we might be guided in discerning the gifts for ministry among all who make up Jesus' body, those with and without disabilities. So to explore this argument, I'll talk more about what I mean when I say the word disability and what I mean when I say the word discernment. <clears throat> 
And next, I'm going to briefly illustrate my own attempts at practicing this kind of discernment in my academic work at the intersections of theology and disability. And then finally, we will consider three baptismal practices, those of preparation, reaffirmation, and testimony as examples of how we might participate in this work of disabled discernment in our own contexts. So I wanna take a bit of time right now to offer some working descriptions of what I have in mind when I talk about disability and about discernment, as well as this notion of disabling discernment that I name in the title of my lecture. The work of defining disability could be an entire lecture in and of itself, or a book, or a career, but I don't have that much time tonight. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge that it's difficult to do justice to all the complex interplays of identities, unlived experiences, and particularities of disabled life. But what I will share is three things that I want us to hold together. First is that the experience of disability relates in some way to human beings encountering significant barriers in their everyday life, their worship, and their work, and within the context in which we find ourselves living. While some interpret the source of these barriers and limitations as the individual bodies and the minds of disabled people, others point to things like the built environment or social assumptions and stigma as the source of that disability. These barriers, whether they are individualized, socialized, or both, emerge for people with a wide range of body minds. Those with physical disabilities, cognitive or intellectual disabilities, congenital disabilities, those with acquired disabilities, people with sensory disabilities, people who are mad or identify with a psychiatric disability, those who experience disabling chronic pain or other ongoing health concerns. Second, when we speak of disability, I think it's always important to acknowledge the pervasive presence of ableism, as well as its effects on disabled people. Dr. Amy Kenny, who is the author of My Body is Not a Prayer Request, a great book title, uh, who was cited by last year's Pine lecturer, Dr. Elizabeth Antis, defines ableism like this, quote, a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. Another definition of ableism we might consider tonight comes from disability studies scholar Michelle Nario Redmond. She defines ableism as prejudice and discrimination toward individuals simply because they are classified as disabled regardless of whether their impairments are physical or mental, visible or invisible. Vernario Redmond, the prejudice and discrimination of ableism arise in attitudes, behaviors, or practices in response to disability, as well as negative cognitive beliefs about people with disabilities. These two realities of describing disability that I've mentioned tonight, experiences of limitation and experiences of ableism, perhaps cast a somewhat negative valence on those of us who identify as disabled. When I think about the experience of being disabled, and I talk with my friends and colleagues and co-researchers with disabilities of all kinds, we almost always not only lament these experiences of oppression and stigma, but also reflect on the beauty of disabled joy, of our disabilities as sites of new generation, new possibilities, new ways of imagining the world and our places of work and of worship. People with disabilities are sometimes called the original life hackers. In the face of discrimination and ableism and oppressions and societal barriers, disabled people find ways to lead, to flourish, to embody joy, both within communities of other disabled folks, as well as with non-disabled loved ones and colleagues and neighbors. Disability is a site of creative abundance and of reimagining how things ought to be in the present as well as the future. As a brief aside on language, you may have already noticed that I alternate between using identity first language, that is saying a disabled person or disabled people, and using person first language, that is saying a person with a disability. In the shifting between identity and person first language, I am seeking to honor my multiple relationships to the disability community as a member, as a professional in research and education and my clinical role, 
and as a colleague and friend to many people with disabilities who express a wide variety of preferred kinds of disability language. So in the lecture tonight, I'm seeking to honor these varying perspectives on disability language and also invite each of us to remain attentive to the language preferences within our own communities. I want us now to shift to a description of discernment. The description of discernment I have in mind for us this evening is a communal Christian practice of attending to the action of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is getting clear about the inbreaking activity of God in our individual lives, in our places of worship, in our communal vocations. The life of discipleship in the church, marked by patterns of prayer, participation in the sacraments, reception of our various traditions, engagement with scripture, these all shape our practice of getting clear about the movements of God in our midst. The practice of discernment requires the work of separation, separating what God is calling us into from what God is calling us away from. In other words, it's a practice of sifting through and sorting out what exactly the Spirit is up to in our lives. Discernment towards clarity of God's desires for us as individuals and as communities is complex in that it requires sustained attention to and perseverance with both our neighbors and ecclesial situations, both of which we often find baffling, or at least I do. In practices of discernment, we may encounter something that leads us to repentance or confession or lament, while equally possible is a discovery of the Spirit's action that brings forth new joys or re-enlivening of faith. We're likely familiar with specific patterns of discernment from our own church contexts. For example, clearness committees in the Quaker tradition emphasize worship and silence and listening to determine whether the spirit is inviting a person or a community to initiate or wait or change a particular endeavor. Ignatian discernment of spirits might lead us in identifying our areas of spiritual consolation where we have a sense of aliveness in our connection to God and to one another, as well as identifying our experiences of spiritual desolation, our sense of perhaps separation from God and from our neighbors. Churches in the Anglican tradition host parish discernment committees, where lay people spend time in a group discerning their call into a new season of lay ministry, or perhaps a possible call to holy orders in the diaconate or the priesthood. And of course, practices of discernment are embedded in relationships many of us have, such as meeting with our spiritual directors, making retreat or taking pilgrimage, or immersive community living as part of discerning a religious vocation. No matter what our tradition, I want us to consider what bringing together disability and discernment might stir up in our relationships, our work and worship, whether in the context of the academy or the church or the community. By using the phrase disabling discernment, I am not suggesting that we limit or dampen or undermine our practices of paying attention to the spirit in our midst. Instead, I envision the process of disabling our practices of discernment as the work of bringing in the category of disability as well as the experiences of disabled people to enrich, to enliven, and to expand our notions of what it means to discern God's calling. Disabling discernment, therefore, seeks to both pay attention to the creativity, joy, and challenges of disabled people, and to consider how a disability perspective might empower us to think about new ways that the Spirit is calling us to act, whether in repentance, in lament, or in celebration. Disabled discernment, a practice impossible without the presence and witness of Christians with disabilities, opens up new possibilities for identifying the Holy Spirit among us between both non-disabled and disabled disciples, all of us who make up the common priesthood of the faithful. What we'll talk about further in the remainder of tonight's lecture is how the process of disabling discernment might help us attend more faithfully to the ministry's gifts, vocation, and leadership roles of disabled Christians. And we will specifically explore this discernment of gifts as it relates to the Holy Spirit's action in baptism.
So nearly a decade ago now, I met the family who I mentioned in the introduction to the lecture tonight, the ones who sought a church that would baptize their daughter with an intellectual disability and who had high support needs. As I mentioned, they were very sadly unsuccessful. One patient or one pastor expressed to my patient's mother that it wouldn't even matter if her daughter were baptized because she couldn't understand what was happening. This family's sharing of their woundedness of baptismal denial led me to a revelation of sorts. I concluded at the time that all the disability theology in the world, or all the disability theology I had read, with its focus on theological anthropology and inclusion in God's image and friendship, could never sufficiently respond to the woundedness embodied in this family I encountered as an occupational therapist, not theology alone. As theologian Jill Harshaw puts it in her assessment of Christian theologians and ethicists who engage with ideas about disability, there remains this lamentable and persistent and inadequate connection between theological theory and ecclesial practices. Put differently, the methodologies and approaches utilized by theologians considering disability often result in insufficient connections between their theological propositions and Christian practice, what's actually happening in the life of the church. This disconnection between ecclesial practices and theological claims renders churches diminished in their capacity to discern the discipleship of people with intellectual disabilities. In my assessment, this disconnection has at its roots a kind of theological abstraction that fuels this impoverished imagination about the work of the spirit. Without robust connections between practice and doctrine, Christian theologies of disability, as well as contemporary churches that engage with these theologies, remain entrenched in patterns of belonging that relegate disabled people to marginalized positions within theological scholarship and within the church, or worse, as in the case of my patient and her family, exclude them entirely. My response to this situation was to seek a way of doing theology that held together ideas about disability and God with a careful discernment of the experiences of intellectually disabled Christians. For me, my research provided an avenue for me to pursue the practice of disabled discernment, an attempt, albeit imperfect, to discern the Spirit's movement in the lives of my co-researchers and to let this movement shape the kind of theology that I write and share. So instead of beginning with my ideas and words and convictions about God, I try to first discern the Spirit's movement in the lives of the Christians with intellectual disabilities I'm collaborating with, receiving from them first their insights, their challenges, their ways of knowing Jesus, and going from there. So what is, exactly does this look like? What does this practice of disabled discernment look like in real life? For me, it included a year traveling around North Carolina to worship with and talk with and sometimes spend time in silence with Christians with intellectual disabilities, as well as their clergy and their loved ones from a wide variety of Christian traditions and denominations. Through listening for and witnessing firsthand the movement of the spirit in my co-researchers' lives, I encountered powerful, painful, joyful, and ordinary stories of what baptismal identity and Christian ministry look like among these disabled Christians. And through work such as the book and tonight's lecture, I seek to bear witness to their new expressions of how we might identify and receive the Spirit's movement in the lives of disciples with disabilities. Embracing the kind of space that John Swinton has named as soulful companioning, which is a slow and attentive accompaniment of others, I began to discern not just unique stories that would be fun to tell from the lives of disabled Christians across North Carolina, but ways that their church communities had discerned their baptismal identities and their gifts for ministry that opened up opportunities for the whole church to grow together and to discern with one another. As I joined these churches as a researcher in discernment and discerning specific charisms and gifts present in my co-researchers' lives, I begin to notice some broader ecclesial practices 
that were sustaining these folks' identities as members of the body of Christ. Perhaps unsurprisingly, these sustaining practices and simultaneous pathways for discernment were often baptismal in nature. So that is where I'd like us to turn next in tonight's lecture, learning about baptismal practices of disabled discernment as ways that we might expand our appreciation of the Spirit's action in our midst among both disabled and non-disabled Christians. So in striking divergence to the story of the repeated baptismal denials that led me to this work of partnering with Christians with intellectual disabilities, three core practices emerged that have really shaped the discernment of my co-researchers in the communities that took part in my work, in our work. These practices were those of baptismal preparation, baptismal reaffirmation, and baptismal testimony. What I want to do now is share examples of each of these baptismal practices, reflecting on how they might help us embody and embrace practices of disabled discernment within our own contexts. And as a brief note moving forward, the names of all the individuals and churches I share tonight have been anonymized to protect their privacy. So first, practices of baptismal preparation. Practices of preparing for baptism offer an opportunity not only for joyful anticipation of the sacrament, but also for rich Christian formation, for nurture, and for vocational discernment. In many of our churches, baptismal preparation might include a pastoral meeting with parents and or the godparents. For adults, preparation might include RCIA or other parallel small group formation experiences in different denominations centered on teachings about the Christian faith and about a life of discipleship. Pastor Soren, who is one of my research partners, shared a story of preparatory baptismal joy he experienced with a congregant with intellectual disabilities named Amanda. Pastor Soren recounted to me, and I'm telling you that almost every night for two months, Amanda would call me on my phone and she would say, when am I gonna get baptized? And I would tell her the date and say, we're going to baptize you then. She just wanted to stay right on top of that. And every night she would call me and ask about her baptism. Amanda shared her joyful anticipation of baptism, not only with Pastor Soren, but with many others in her congregation. And her church's reception of Amanda's baptismal anticipation not only provided an occasion for joy, but it additionally served as an avenue of holy preparation to receive Amanda's baptismal vocation, a preparation that formed the congregation in the long-term work of discerning her gifts for ministry, supporting her in that ministry past her baptism day, and seeking her flourishing in the particularities of her baptismal vocation and her disability identity. Liturgical theologian Alexander Schmemann wrote about practices of baptismal preparation as a double rhythm of the church. As our churches prepare to welcome the newly baptized and discern the gifts for ministry that the Spirit imparts to them, we who are already baptized also live anew into a discernment of how we are fulfilling our own baptismal calls to ministry. This double rhythm of preparation and fulfillment provides us with opportunities to prepare our communities to discern the baptismal ministries alive in each baptized member, just as Amanda's anticipation of her baptism and preparation for this day in her life of faith welcomed her congregation to discern not only her new season of Christian vocation, but how their own gifts might support and complement the Spirit's work in Amanda's life. This work of holy preparation and fulfillment also helps shape congregations as places where we will be faithful to keep the promises we make in our baptismal liturgies. As we prepare together, not just for a single day where we celebrate the newly baptized, but for a lifetime of discernment and support and proclamation, proclaiming the work of the Spirit in each baptized Christian's life. Some congregations who participated in my research explored this baptismal preparation practice as an opportunity for intergenerational fellowship, and others as an opportunity for partnership and formation with other local churches from different traditions and denominations. <clears throat> 
Some of these groups also use the baptismal liturgy itself to help prepare and shape participants with and without intellectual disabilities. One Christian with an intellectual disability, Hikari, shared with me what she liked best about the baptismal liturgy in her Episcopal parish, stating, I really like the mind that the church wants you to have, a questioning mind, which means they want you to ask questions. Hikari and I talked about the prayer she mentioned, which is the prayer that immediately follows baptism in the Episcopal Church's Book of Common Prayer. And an excerpt of it goes like this. Sustain the newly baptized, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Hikari reflected to me how she thought this baptismal prayer for discernment should challenge the church in supporting disabled members and promoting disability justice. Hikari has not always felt welcomed in her parish. In fact, she was once asked to leave her acolyte ministry after many, many years of service due to her disability. But one reason Hikari has remained at her parish through this painful experience of exclusion was because she was surrounded by other parishioners who pushed for the leadership, both lay and clergy, to discern anew Hikari's gifts for ministry and her roles within the church. These parishioners embodied the kinds of questions that allowed Hikari to reconnect with her accolade ministry in the church and shaped her in her gifts of questioning the status quo in her parish. My conversation with Hikari about this baptismal prayer for discernment also challenged me to receive this prayer as an invitation to attend to the witness of disciples with disabilities who may call forth different discernments and different ways of knowing in the church. Specifically, Hikari's experience of the baptismal liturgy challenged me to move beyond a superficial identification of potentially ableist language that I was very worried about in this liturgy. The prayer, after all, to me, seemed to only be applicable to those of us who are cognitively capable of inquiring and discerning. But instead, Hikari's perspective prepared me to receive the baptismal liturgy in our shared tradition as a call to practices of disabled discernment, different ways of knowing and different ways of perceiving the spirit. These practices opened up a fuller disability awareness in me and can open up within all of us a new awareness in perceiving and receiving gifts for ministry among all the baptized. So in addition to these occasions to interact with the liturgy and other Christian disciples through practices of baptismal preparation, practices of baptismal reaffirmation also provide a pathway of discernment of the gifts for ministry bestowed on all Christians in baptism. Liturgies of baptismal remembrance and reaffirmation often occur at the same time that congregations welcome the newly baptized, such as the Easter Vigil. As we witness the baptism of new Christians, we might ask God for the strength and courage to discern our own baptismal vocations to ministry. And at the same time, as we reaffirm our baptismal identities, we might ask God to help for help and patience in discerning the baptismal vocations of others in our midst, because it's hard work. We might also practice repentance and lament as we remember our baptisms repenting of the ways that we have downplayed or ignored the baptismal gifts for ministry among disabled Christians and non-disabled Christians alike. During my research process, the community at St. Mary's Episcopal Church provided me with an example of how practices of baptismal reaffirmation can transform discernment. Bob, who's a man in his late 30s, and his parents, Barbara and Jim, have been members of St. Mary's for almost the entirety of Bob's life. Though Bob does not communicate with speech and requires significant support in his day-to-day -day life with an intellectual disability, his congregation offers regular thanks to God for Bob's life of discipleship. As a researcher, I was fortunate to receive these powerful discernments about Bob's ministry. So when the priest at St. Mary's celebrates baptismal reaffirmation, sprinkling the baptismal waters over the whole gathered parish, 
Bob's community shares how he always receives these waters with both of his arms spread wide open. This reminds the community that Bob and that each of them is a beloved child of God, made an indispensable part of Jesus' body in baptism. And these are the words of um, Bob's fellow parishioners. Bob's community offers this kind of honoring of Bob's witness to them in services of baptismal reaffirmation, not because Bob is some perfect angelic presence in their parish, because there are days when Bob doesn't want to be a part of the life of his parish, as I assume there are days for many of us. St. Mary's discernment of Bob's baptismal vocation comes from a community whose practice sustained presence and commitment and attention to Bob for the long run. Through times they describe as both Bob's ministerial presence amongst them, as well as times of challenging disruption. Like St. Mary's discerning Bob's gifts for ministry, especially in liturgies of baptismal remembrance, broader practices of baptismal reaffirmation can remind us that fellow parishioners or clergy members that we find disruptive or puzzling or wonderful or indispensable or infuriating are each those who depend upon us and the whole of the baptized body to discern their vocation to Christian ministry in an ongoing way. Reaffirming our baptismal identities can be the first step in opening ourselves to recognizing and discerning these gifts in others. We'll visit again St. Mary's discernment of Bob's gifts for Christian ministry as we consider a final practice of disabled discernment that of the practice of baptismal testimony. Testimonies at the occasion of someone's baptism or a testimony that proclaims a community's discernment of someone's baptismal vocation is an act of joyful proclamation. In my research, practices of testimony included instances of discrete spoken testimony before the occasion of baptism or highlighting the fruit of someone's post-baptismal vocation to discipleship. Practices of testimony also included wordless demonstrations of Christian faith. Pastor Daniel, who is a faith leader at a cooperative Baptist church, shared the following with his parishioners on the occasion of the baptism of Danny, an older man with an intellectual disability. He said, most folks, are not going to remember what I preached about today, but they will never forget what they see you preach in your actions. You know, the very core of our faith is that in being buried with Jesus, we are raised with him to a life like his. You are preaching this, Danny, in what you do today. And indeed, when Danny recounted his baptismal day to me, he exclaimed, I was buried just like Jesus was. I was buried like Jesus. I was buried like Jesus and rose again, rose up from the dead. Baptismal testimony calls communities to discern the witness of people with intellectual disabilities, either on the occasion of a baptism itself or in recalling one's baptism through an anniversary or another kind of celebration discerning and then recording and then proclaiming testimony of the Spirit's work of each member in Jesus' body is one way that our collective baptismal newness of life might be sustained. James, a young adult with an intellectual disability, recalled to me his practice of preparing a t baptismal testimony before the day of his baptism. James was also uh, attending a Baptist church. He said to me, I was preparing with my mom she helped me tell my testimony to my sister. The work of baptismal testimony for James came from this interdependent effort with his family. Their voices added to amplify his own witness to his life as a disciple. At James's community of faith, St. Matthew's Baptist Church, testimonies are read immediately prior to the celebration of a baptism. Regardless of disability identity, however, the person to be baptized never reads their own testimony. Rather, their testimony is proclaimed by a loved one or a friend in the church. James's baptismal testimony, proclaimed by his sister over 15 years ago, went like this. Jesus, you are my master and Lord. Jesus, you are my friend. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, all of the church, for loving and helping me.
Reflecting on the day of his baptism and his baptismal testimony, James told me, in my baptism, I rise just like Jesus did. When pastor dunked me in the water, he called me a beloved son, just like Jesus. James remembers his baptism as deeply connected with his identity as a beloved one of Jesus because he has watched a video of his testimony and baptism at least once a week and sometimes daily for over 15 years. While James's example of this practice of testimony is powerful, it seems to require that the baptismal candidate can either compose or express their testimony in a written or a verbal manner. Put differently, words seem necessary for those testifying on their own behalf or those working to discern and amplify the testimony of another. So what about Christians with intellectual disabilities who do not communicate with spoken or with written words? In my conversation with Anna, who is a lay leader at Holy Angels Church, she wondered out loud how baptismal practices of celebration and discernment might make space for the testimony of people who are non-speaking. Anna expressed her question to me in this way. I really struggle sometimes about how our church holds people up. There are some kids that don't have those cultural successes, you know? They're living their lives, but they're not academically stars. I think in church it's hard to celebrate with the people that have been baptized and grew up here, and at the same time recognize that somebody, they're maybe not having those kind of hallmarks in their lives. How do we make sure that all are celebrated? Anna presented me with this conundrum, sharing her deeply unsettled feelings about the church discerning and celebrating the academic career and social successes of its baptized members, celebrations which often exclude people with intellectual disabilities, especially within her parish. These cultural successes, as Anna understood them, threaten to displace the primacy of baptismal identity at the heart of the church's life together in their practices of belonging. And these easily recognizable and discernible successes apparent to the vast majority of church members, things like wedding anniversaries or scholarships or college graduations, they really illustrate the limited imagination that many of us may carry when it comes to not only celebrating the cultural successes of Christians, but even more importantly, discerning the gifts for Christian ministry among our brothers and sisters with intellectual disabilities. Anna's question spurred my thinking about how practices of baptismal testimony might serve as a powerful witness among people with intellectual disabilities who are non-speakers. As I wrestled alongside Anna with her struggles, I recalled not only Pastor Daniel's insistence of the preaching that's accomplished in the act of being baptized, in his words, a sermon that would preach much longer and much more powerfully than the words of his homily on the same day. But another example of baptismal testimony as a pathway for discernment also came to mind, a communal creation of testimony on the occasion of baptisms, baptismal anniversaries or services of reaffirmation. We will return again to the Bob at St. Mary's and his gifts for ministry to explore this practice of testimony as disabled discernment. Bob's parish receives his wordless testimony of a baptismal vocation to following Jesus by proclaiming how Bob ushers his parish into worshipful embrace of hymns and the sung liturgy through Bob's joyful participation in assisting the parish choir director, which has now been established as a paid employment role for him. Bob's community also testifies to Bob's vocation of presence a vocation they have discerned quite powerfully over the years of Bob's presence in their parish. Bob will often sit next to someone who is in mourning in the community, participating in discipleship through the power of the Spirit in a wordless offering of accompaniment. Again, these are the words from his fellow parishioners. Bob's community offers this kind of testimony not as a simple telling or retelling of a nice story or anecdote. Rather, the testimony of Bob's baptismal identity as a disciple who accompanies those, who leads people into the power of the sung liturgy 
comes from a community who has practiced sustained commitment to and discernment with Bob over the long run through times that they describe as Bob's prophetic presence among them and also his problematic disruption. Their sustained discernment at St. Mary's provides a practice of testimony that functions over time to dismantle negative stereotypes within their community's imagination about Bob and other Christians with intellectual disabilities. This kind of testimony exemplified by the community at St. Mary's, the practice of the community coming to a, together to identify and proclaim a testimony of baptismal discipleship for someone who expresses it through a wordless vocation, provides another path of discernment for the church to take seriously the gifts for ministry among all Christians. This work of discernment and testimony can also be cultivated in ecclesial settings where infants and young children are baptized, like most of ours, identifying and proclaiming their gifts to the community as a testimony of the centrality of baptismal identity and also as an additional sign of the community's promises to support these children throughout their baptismal lives and vocation. This kind of testimony could be written anew each year as the community comes to know someone more deeply, comes to know a baby who becomes a toddler and a young adult, becoming more closely attuned to their gifts and their needs in the church, whether they have a disability or not. This baptismal testimony is a co-construction between the baptized disciple and those who surround them, affirming their indispensability in Jesus' body and discerning patterns of life together marked not only by just inclusion, but by belonging and ministry together. The work of discernment, whether through baptismal preparation, reaffirmation, or testimony, falls as a responsibility upon the baptized body as a whole, all of us. And it is through practices of discerning the work of the Holy Spirit among all the baptized, not just people with intellectual disabilities, that churches come to more carefully attend to all who gather to worship God, more keenly listen to and perceive the movement of the Spirit, and more readily proclaim the good news of radically transformed life in Jesus Christ. It is through disabled discernment, not only in describing the gifts of the Spirit enabling Christian ministry amongst the common priesthood of the faithful, but proclaiming these gifts, that we might encounter more profound depth of the Spirit's action in our midst. I'm going backwards. <laughs> I find it somewhat difficult to offer a concluding word that speaks more powerfully than the witnesses of Amanda or Danny or Hikari or James or Bob in their own embodiment of their particular vocations to Christian ministry, as well as their church community's practices of discernment that identify and amplify these gifts. However, people always ask me at talks like this, what story was most important to me or most powerful to me in doing this work? So I'll speak to that a bit tonight. I think the most honest answer is that the most powerful thing about my research was the emphasis that so many of my co-researchers, particularly disabled Christians, had upon Jesus in word and deed as we talked about baptism and worship together and spent time together during the research process. And I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this because I had some very grand ideas coming into the research project that focused on baptism and disability that didn't have a lot to do with Jesus, I hate to say. I wanted to think about bodies and epistemic injustice and the normate and crypt time. And because I'm me, I did think about these things in my research. But in receiving the witness of my research participants, which took me down the theological avenues I pursue in the book, I was invited into a much clearer focus on how all of us who are baptized have this deep abiding connection with Jesus. We share in his death and resurrection, his newness of life, and we share in God's proclamation over each of our lives that we are beloved, just as God the Father proclaimed at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. As James put it to me during one of our conversations together, Sarah, baptism is really about you're a beloved child. Since I got baptized, I become a beloved son. So I suppose that in closing, I want to share how the baptismal practices of discernment that I encountered from my research partners 
continue to shape how I approach my own life of faith. I find myself reflecting almost every day, and this is completely honest, almost every day on how those around me are beloved children, wondering how the spirit might be alive and active in their lives. This I take not to just be the work of the Holy Spirit in my own life, but the work of disabled discernment. As my research partners with intellectual disabilities testified to me and led me into, it is central to approach others as beloved children not as problems to be solved or issues to be fixed or discomforts or disruptions in our churches that we must first resolve. Curiosity about the Spirit's action in those surrounding me has invited a sustained practice of discernment with a baptismal lens as I approach my neighbors and my family, my students, my colleagues. How has my imagination about their gifts for ministry been restricted? Where do I need to confess this and repent? And as a practice of exploring my own baptismal vocation for ministry, how do I receive both the discernments and the gifts of others? I hope that tonight's exploration of disabled discernment will spur each of us to think about at least one new approach to recognizing the Spirit's work and movement within the body of Christ, empowering all the baptized with gifts for ministry. May the Spirit empower us to be especially attentive to discerning those persons and gifts that have gone undiscerned or unappreciated in our midst. Thank you so much. So I have some post-lecture discussion questions for us all. We're going to take about the next five minutes. Um, also, if you need to move your body in any way, <laughs> I should have said that at the beginning. Um, please take this opportunity to do so. Uh, we'll turn to our neighbors, those of us who are gathered here, your human neighbors, those of you who are joining virtually, your furry neighbors, or whoever else is in your home. And you can talk through one or both of these discussion questions, and then we'll reconvene as a whole for some more discussion and question and answer. And because I like to put universal design for learning into practice, those joining virtually have a QR code, so they've actually had access to the text of the lecture as well as the slides. And everyone attending in person will also get that on their way out. Um, so no one will be left out. But because I like universal design for learning, I'm going to read aloud the questions on the screen and then dismiss us to um, chat amongst ourselves for about five minutes. So question one is, what surprised you most in tonight's lecture? And what next question or practice might you engage because of this surprise or as a result of this surprise? And then my second question for y'all to consider is what barriers or supports for practicing discernment or practicing disabled discernment, be they theological or structural, personal or practical, exist within your own communities of work or worship? Uh, and talk more with your neighbor or your pet about how you might address these barriers or how you might be recommitted to kind of reinforcing the supports that you see within these contexts. So um, we'll welcome discussion or questions or comments from anyone in here. And if you wish to contribute to the conversation, if you can just raise a hand and um, someone will bring a microphone to you. And I think we're also able to receive questions from the virtual audience as well. So I will wait in silence. Um. Th thank you for this wonderful talk. Can you tell us a bit more about your own relationship to the disability community? Do you identify as someone with a disability through your work? Have you been able to help sacrament deniers change their positions and allow people with to receive the sacraments? Great question. Potentially a long answer, but I'll try and keep it short. So uh, I do identify as a person with a disability. I have non-apparent disabilities um, as a result of multiple chronic health conditions. 
happy to talk about the details of that more offline, or you can read my um, new journal article on the uh, Journal of Christian Bioethics, which talks about chronic pain and the Stations of the Cross, if you're interested in either of those things. Um, so yes, I do identify as someone who's disabled, but have kind of had a a complicated relationship with that identity, um, and also a complicated relationship with disclosing that um, because of ableism and the discrimination that disabled people face, particularly in the academy, which is uh, where I work. So uh, I, yeah, I am saying this now at a public lecture, and I, I've said it in, in the book and in other places too, but I do identify that way. Um, through my presence in these communities, I was um, truly going in as a qualitative researcher, and some people describe my work as ethnography. I don't think it was a full ethnography, and I'm not uh, trained in anthropology, so I'm a little bit hesitant to label myself as an ethnographer. But what I really tried to do was not come in without bias or come in kind of um, without any subjective um, beliefs or things like that, because that's silly. We all always carry around biases, and we're going to come into situations with things that we think should be different or things that we want to transform. But my role in the churches that I worshipped with was as a researcher, and that was always announced in the, the worshipping communities I partnered with. So I actually not only um, worked with folks to gain consent or assent, uh, for people who I spent time with them and their f immediate families and pastors who participated, but I also got communal consent uh, or institutional consent really from these congregations to be a part of their life. So I was not there to teach theology classes. I was not there to tell them what was right about or wrong about how they were treating their congregants with disabilities. I was not there to critique their disability ministries or lack thereof. I was really there as someone who was trying as much as I could to worship with them and to truly explore what was authentically happening in the community. One maybe benefit or one just implication of what did happen is people knew that I was researching about baptism and disability, and so people started paying attention to that more. Um, and I am still in touch with many of these churches, and they have just really flourishing, I wouldn't even say disability ministries, because these none of the churches that I worked with in the work of the book were kind of folks who said, oh, we have like this big disability ministry at our church, this is what we're known for. They're just churches of Christians who also happen to have folks with intellectual disabilities who are present there. And, and so I think they've just um, been kind of beacons in their community to really live into that part of their communal vocation of we're a place that welcomes people with intellectual disabilities. We've seen like all the gifts that they can bring as disciples. They're not just like angels or people who are our friends or, you know, they have like complicated, very human relationships with the parishioners with intellectual disabilities. And I think that has been been made known in their communities. And because I was with with them, I think they were thinking about that maybe a little bit more than if I hadn't been there. But um, I don't think my presence um, spurred on uh, any of these changes um, that happened or any of these kind of recommitments to ministry. I think that is definitely the work of the spirit. Um, the family who'd given me permission to share the story about the baptismal denials, they are still in a, a time of, of life that they are, are still stepped away from the church um, because to go to dozens of churches and be turned away is um, really, really wounding. Um, I'm still in touch with them, but they have not uh, found a congregation or have not been able to go back to a congregation yet. Thank you for the question. I thank you for your talk very much. Can you talk about your training in occupational therapy and maybe how it's informed your theological reflection and the work that you did in this project and what unique insights it might offer to the project? Sure. We were just talking about this during the break. Um, so yeah, I mean, I when I started doing theological work at Duke, I did a master in theological studies, and then I tell people they accidentally let me into the THD. I think they were like, OT, is that Old Testament? No, it's occupational therapy, but you still let me in. Um, and I was really interested in writing um, a theological dissertation that was thinking about theological anthropology, so who are human beings in light of who we know the triune God to be. 
But I wanted to write a theological anthropology that um, an informed layperson or a clergy member or a scholar could pick up. And they could see their child or their family member or their neighbor with a a really significant intellectual disability in those pages and in that theology and not have to like look in the footnotes, which it's constantly what I was finding myself doing as I was researching as a theological student. I was like, oh, here's the disability footnote. (laughs) Like we just have to kind of bracket off people with disabilities and we'll do the rest of our theological anthropology. And I think that's a phenomenal project, an ongoing project that needs lots of diverse uh, perspectives and voices. But it was actually in encountering this family in the context of my clinical practice that I shifted my whole focus of my doctoral research, which eventually became the book. So I talked to this family. Their pseudonyms in the book are Hallie, the daughter, and her mom, Heather. And I could not get this story out of my brain. It is truly what kept me up at night. And I thought, okay, uh, I think I need to do theology differently. And it kind of turned me back to the roots of how I had been trained as an occupational therapist. So for those who don't know, and a lot of people think OTs are just like a different kind of PT, which is not true. (laughs) Occupational therapist, kind of the center of everything we do is thinking about occupation, which is not your job that you have, although it could be a job that you have, but occupation is anything that we occupy our time with. It's things that we want to do, things we need to do, things we're expected to do, things that bring meaning to our life, that cultivate belonging, that help us um, connect with our being. And these things are things like brushing our teeth or sleeping or eating, um, but also things like participating in a faith community. And one of the things that was really impressed upon me on my OT training here in Boston was the strengths-based perspective and just this perspective that we need to start with the assumption of competence, which is um, a big assumption and a kind of a essential kind of theme and mantra in special education and occupational therapy and some other related professions, that we must start by assuming this person with a disability or this person without a disability is competent, and we must somehow start with their strengths. And um, that led me to think about, okay, well, what are the strengths of these folks with disabilities that so many people are like refusing to baptize or are saying are really disruptive in church? Like, are we really that kind of narrow in our imagination about human beings that we can only see the things they're struggling with? I always start my occupational therapy evaluations with, and I work with children, I ask parents or caregivers, describe the best possible day with your kid that you could for me. And many of them have actually never heard this question before, especially if their child is younger. Um, They've just been like visiting doctors and getting diagnoses and being like, your child's not gonna walk, your child can't eat, your child has all these barriers. Um, And so I think to start with, can you describe what you love about your relationship with your child? Can you describe um, in these churches that I did research with what this person's ministry is, what your community would be like if they weren't here? How would you be um, less of the body of Christ without their presence? Um, And I think that's a really, it was a really powerful reframing for the folks I got to collaborate with in my research. And I think it's directly related to my work as a clinician, kind of on a day-to-day basis, but then also kind of philosophically as an OT, being oriented to strengths and paying attention to the everyday um, and not necessarily a silver lining, but um, folks have have things that they're passionate about, have things that bring them joy, and why can't we start there instead of starting with deficit? More to be said, but that's it for tonight. (laughs) Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Um, I was struck by your conclusion that that one of the most um, consistent things that were said by people that you were working with, they were talking about Jesus. And, and I'm wondering, as, as you reflect on that, what, kind of what do you think about that? Uh, um, if, if you have a sense that, well, that was because they were in, in a particular kind of church or, or the people that they were encountering. I'm just kind of curious, what do you make of that? Because it, it's, it is very striking and, and kind of challenging in it also, too, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, 
I don't think it's a particular kind of church. I mean, we heard from tonight a couple of Episcopalians and several Baptists, but there were Lutherans, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, non-denominational Christians, Pentecostals, United Methodists. I think I've captured them all. So uh, we had Christians across the gamut who contributed to the work of this project. And truly, the, the central theme, there were three central themes that really emerged from my conversations with them and my worship in these communities. They were Jesus, community, and participation. And as I mentioned, I was really interested in like writing about the body and the normie and stuff, but those things didn't ever seem to come up. And so uh, the way I think I um, have a responsibility to my co-researchers and to be accountable and respectful to them, I wanted to take these three themes that they kind of led me to and run with them and put those themes into theological reflection with liturgies and with theologians and with Christian ethicists and then with these ecclesial practices that I talked about in the last section. I think the emphasis on Jesus does come down to two things. One, that I think these folks are just more faithful than I am and are thinking about their identities as connected to Jesus pretty constantly. And one source for that, I mean, because not everyone was like James and not everyone like has the video of their baptism and is watching it every day. Well, I'm like, that would probably be good if we all had that, you know, like I wonder what kind of disciples we would become if we watched our baptisms constantly. Um, and hopefully we're, you know, receiving the newly baptized and being encouraged by that and reminded of our connection to one another and to Jesus. But I think um, apart from kind of this uh, idea of identity that folks really grasped onto, identity rooted in Jesus and being connected to Jesus, was this sense of that scripture was alive for them and that the stories of Jesus's baptism were so important. I, I kind of had this very wide open question that I talked about with all of my research participants. I did not even mention baptism. It was at like the very beginning of our interviews, and I was just like, let's just talk about the Bible. What do you do about that? What do you think about it? What's in the Bible? People were like quizzing me on the differences of the account. Like Christians with intellectual disabilities were like quizzing me, like, what are the differences in the synoptic gospels of the accounts of Jesus' baptism? And I was like, oh, no, I don't know. Um, but like scriptural imagination, to use a Duke phrase, um, scriptural imagination was alive in these, in these folks' lives and their churches again, across across different denominations. And so I, I think also visual depictions of Jesus are, are very present in many of these <coughs> congregations. And it's kind of another nod to this universal design for learning. Like if we receive information in different ways with these rich visual depictions of Jesus or even Jesus' baptism in the stained glass or in icons that we have, if we see the font every Sunday, every day when we come to Mass, if we you know, smell the incense, if we smell the chrism, if we feel the water. I mean, baptism is this like multi-sensory delight. And so I also think that um, visual depictions of Jesus in these churches were really important for some folks. Um, and I just, as an aside, well, not really an aside, but the cover of the book, I always want to um, lift up the artist who um, rendered the modern icon uh, that is on the front of my book. It's uh, her name is Ivanka Demchuk. She's a Ukrainian modern iconographer. And I actually have a bigger um, print of the icon in my home. And I have an eight-month-old. And every single day, we walk down the stairs, and the icon's at the bottom of the stairs with a mirror. And for, like, <coughs> a couple weeks, he was staring in the mirror because he's eight months old. He's, like, waving, smiling. <coughs> Excuse me. But a couple weeks ago, he just started staring at Jesus and the icon. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like not looking in the mirror anymore. So five minutes every morning, every day, we look at Jesus and the icon. And I'm like, oh, maybe if I spent more time at my parish, like some of my co-researchers did, you know, this would, this would feel connected for me too. And of course, it does feel really connected after the research. So that's a bit about my hunches as to why connection with Jesus was such a big part of the researchers emphasis. Okay, we, we have a couple more here Great. from the um, online <coughs> audience. Actually, a couple people have kind of a related question around the topic of vulnerability. Um, the first is, 
uh, has the question is around you know with different technological advances and um, adaptive technologies and stuff. Um, in the context of that, how do you see, uh, you know, what's your theological understanding of vul vulnerability in the context of disability? Um, and the other person um, is asking more, is, is there a role of vulnerability as a privileged opportunity for the activity of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Great questions. Um, I want to name that vulnerability is not always a good in disability conversations. Um, I think, you know, 30 years ago in some of the initial disability theology that was coming out, or not even disability theology, but just theologians who were thinking about folks with disabilities as kind of exemplars for Christian life and community, vulnerability was really lifted up. Like, look at these people who are so vulnerable. And we know we know now, and I think people knew then but weren't acknowledging it, that, you know, for example, women with um, intellectual disabilities are like something like 400% more likely to survive um, sexual assault. Like 70% of women, there was a NPR report came out a few years ago on this from Joe Shapiro that 70% of women with intellectual disabilities have survived sexual assault. Uh, and that is because they are vulnerable. Um, and that is not something that I obviously take lightly and I don't think vulnerability should be kind of an uncontested good or an uncontested term when we're talking about it in connection to disability. Um, I do think that the Holy Spirit like shows up in our human limitations and vulnerabilities, but I also, as uh, my colleague and uh, friend Debbie Kramer says, like, human limitation and disability are like unsurprising realities in human life. Like vulnerability is a very unsurprising part of being a human being. We are all limited, we are all frail, we are all vulnerable. Um, but some of us have those heightened vulnerabilities because of our disability identity, because of our racial or gender identity. And I think it is the work of um, our neighbors and each other as communities to protect one another when those vulnerabilities are taken advantage of or when violence occurs. Um, so yes, I think obviously the Holy Spirit works in and through human beings as we are. Um, and I think it should be less surprising than it is to us that you know folks have disability identities or more significant limitations. I'm not sure I fully understand the technology and vulnerability question, but maybe that's my own limitations with technology. <laughs> so I don't know if we have a chance to rephrase that question or um, one last question from in the room or online. Sure. Um, one, uh, one of the people uh, who submitted asked about if you could say more about um, the wordless displays of faith that people have used in the baptismal service. So I've, I'm thinking maybe there are some concrete uh, stories that you could tell or something like that. Great. I will say the book has a lot more stories in it. <laughs> and you'll see the same, the same people. They have the same names in the book as I used tonight. Um, but in terms of concrete examples, I mean, I think what Pastor Daniel was getting at was literally, um, I mean, they are in a Baptist church. They do full immersion. And so it was bringing Danny, who's a big guy, um, up to the baptistry and literally dunking him all the way in the water three times. And that being this visual um, sermon is what Pastor Daniel said of dying and, and resurrecting with Christ. I think there are a lot of things that happen in our baptismal liturgies. I think about um, gathering around the font. In my parish, it's like you we invite all the kids up so they can see over everyone who's standing and that's kind of an amazing thing like when do we invite children to be like front and center well maybe we do it a lot and because we have a lot of baptisms but that is like preaching a kind of sermon that's like inviting a kind of wordless discipleship that is an honoring of children's faith and children's engagement with the sacraments that we're seeing as baptisms take place. I think the songs we sing and the scriptures we read at baptism are, um, maybe they're not wordless, but the, there's more to music than the lyrics and the words. 
I think um, the sign of the cross um, that the priest or the pastor in many of our traditions and some of the traditions of the research participants um, give in baptism, the smelling of the chrism, like I said before, these are all things that kind of evoke um, God's presence and that people see repeated times throughout their lives and are connected, hopefully they're connected to their own experience of baptism, even though, you know, I assume most of us in this room can't remember our baptisms. <laughs> I was two months old. Um, so those are some cr concrete things. And I think about the example of Bob. Um, you know, it's really interesting, like, to pay attention to what folks do with their time or like who they prioritize talking to in coffee hour or fellowship. And I think, you know, Bob's parish has done this and that's how they noticed that he was really often gravitating towards people, gravitating towards people who are in mourning or had gone through a loss or some kind of bereavement. And they were like, wait, <laughs> like he is totally ministering to these folks without any words because he doesn't speak with um, he doesn't have speech. He communicates a lot, but just not with speech um, and picking up on that wordless form of discipleship. But I think that caused the church to see like, okay, what people weren't showing up for the bereaved or, or what, uh, where were they putting their bodies? Where were they going during coffee hour? So um, not only did Bob kind of have this and still has this, this wordless vocation, but I think it caused people to reflect more on okay, where do I put my body? Who, who do I want to draw close to? Who do I want to kind of push away? And um, how might the Spirit be inviting me to act differently? We only have a few minutes left, so and I see Megan standing there. <laughs> so I think uh, I'll leave the rest of the discussion for um, offline. Y'all can reach me on my email. Um, the slides, like I said, all of you online have them, and Kara has um, a QR code for you going out, and I also have my references. I just, as an academic, I have to say, all my references are on there. Thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you.